Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And today we have Brother Imran Hussein joining us, who is a researcher and he's a member of Sapiens Institute. His focus engages with new atheism and presents a positive case for Islam. Imran regularly delivers talks on various topics, including God's existence, the purpose of life, the existential implications of atheism, and the miracle of the Quran. And he's the author of the forthcoming book, Dying to Believe, which is a book which talks about the meaning of life uh, and, and the relationship and, and with nihilism as well. So thank you for joining us, Imran. It's my pleasure, bro. Jazakallah khair for having me. Alhamdulillah. I'm very excited for this discussion. Um, and I think, you know, the best place to kind of start off at is at the root. So can you ex give a brief explanation as to what nihilism is and maybe an example of it? Okay, so... so the word nihilism itself, it's its its quite a broad uh, term in, in, as far as the way it's been defined and the way people have sort of used it throughout history. But I think a sort of good summarized definition for, for where we're going with this is it's basically the position where there is a, a lack of meaning. It's, it's basically meaninglessness. Now, if you look at, if we be a bit more specific and say, you know, existential nihilism, which some of the academics have, have sort of posited as a, uh, the sort of general umbrella uh, of nihilism, which is that life in itself is meaningless. And there's branches that come off it, such as cosmic nihilism, moral nihilism, and the list goes on. Um, so, but the general idea and the way they link it is, well, existentially, if life itself at bottom is meaningless, then every aspect of life, whether it's the moral aspect of life or the way we perceive the universe and the order of the universe or the lack thereof, uh, everything else comes under that that sort of umbrella of existential nihilism, which is that life at bottom is ultimately meaningless. Um, so that's how I would define it. It's the lack of meaning, uh, nihilism. Okay. So can you? It's it's almost like saying that there's no ultimate purpose or meaning. Um, and I know some philosophers have also defined it as no criteria for distinguishing between true or false or good and evil. Uh -huh. Yeah, they, they refer to that um, as, if I can recall, that specifically, in, as, as far as truth is concerned and that there is no ultimate truth, um, I think it's called epistemic. There are some of some refer to it as epistemic nihilism, which is, well, when it comes to mm -hmm. truth, and it's very prevalent today, especially yeah. in this postmodern uh, exactly. community that we're, we're a part of, that, you know, truth is subjective. It's up to you. You know, you... You determine what's true to you, uh, but there is no, there's no, there is no ultimate objective truth out there. It's what you perceive to be true, uh, or what you consider to be true for yourself. Um, and that's why I think nihilism is big, bro. It's it's a very prevalent topic, and it actually, maybe we can get into this discussion as we go along. It's actually affecting Muslims as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, we may not be, may not even be be aware of it because you would assume, okay, you're Muslim, so or I'm Muslim, and therefore, you know, I'm someone that follows Islam. I believe in Allah. Uh, and everything Allah has told us in the Quran, etc. Uh, but many Muslims are suffering from what I refer to as, you know, Muslim nihilism or Islamic nihilism, mm -hmm. um, which which is so go. It's just something under the carpet. It's something people don't realize is happening, but they may be experiencing the implications of that in their lives, but may not be able to sort of draw that sort of intellectual link and and know what's actually going on. And it's a part. It's 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 it's. It's inevitable in some ways, but it's something that we have to counter and o overcome because the way society is set up today, it's pushing us, you know, to um, essentially hearken onto some form of nihilism, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where, 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 you, where it tries to inject meaning into your life from one perspective, but ultimately at bottom life is meaningless. And it all ties in with secularism and how, you know, the, the turning away from God or what that means and the implications of that. But again, we'll sort of unpack this as, as we go along again. Yeah. yeah, but I think like the general gist that uh, for everyone to understand is nihilism is the idea there's, there's, no me there's no ultimate meaning in one's life. There's no purpose. And, you know, an example of that is like somebody who just, you know, doesn't want to do anything, who's just kind of, you know, realizes there's no purpose to life um, and just kind of wants to just sit around and not do anything. Um but like b before we even get to all the big juicy topics, the one question I just want to ask you is what are the factors that contribute to nihilism? You know, you, you gave a video on Sapiens Institute where you kind of talked about the history of nihilism and maybe just like very briefly just explain, you know, in the last 
100, 200 years, what are the factors that have contributed to nihilism? Because it seems like, you know, we are at the highest moment, like no society has had more nihilism than, you know, the Mm -hmm. current modern world. Yeah, and it's 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 so it's like you said it's a long history, but if if you were to sort of summarize it, um, you know throughout history up until the point of you can say the Enlightenment period, uh, you know up until the 18th 19th century, the predominant way that humanity looked at life for the cosmology, their their way of looking at the world and their position within the universe, was always centered around the idea of God. People believed in a higher power, a supreme being, whether it was through Christianity, Hinduism, you know, or any other world faith. The majority of the world throughout history, and even today, you can argue, was uh, religious. Uh, but again, the way we understand religious today as compared to religious, say, 200 years ago, is a totally different thing. Um, in, in what way? People, in what so way? It, even the way the, the term religion is used since the period of enlightenment, it's totally different for the way we would understand a religion. Uh, Karen Armstrong, in, in one of her recent books, uh, I think it's called Fields of Blood. It's a very interesting book. Even in the in the beginning of the book, she uh, highlights that the way the term religion is used now, the sort of definition of that is it's a set of practices that one does in their personal life. So mm-hmm. it's religion is seen as something that it's something that the individual does in their own personal life and keeps it out of the, the the sphere of the secular. They don't take okay. it out into the world. Um, and that's not how religion was seen throughout history. Whether it was Christianity, most of the Christian sects never saw religion like this. They saw it as a, as a holistic way of life. Uh, you can look at Hinduism, the concept of uh, dharam, as they refer to it. It's, some, yeah. it's, it's a totality, a, a whole way of life. Islamically, we know the term is deen. Uh, you know, deen, if we were to sort of translate it roughly, it means a comprehensive way of life. And that, it, that means it factors in all aspects of life, not just a set of practices you may do in your individual personal life by yourself behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. it was interesting. And you can see how the, the, the and words are very powerful. And, you know, the powers that may be know the words are very, very powerful. So by changing the definition or the meaning of a word, you can create some big changes within society. Um, mm-hmm. So going back to the point the, the, that predominantly the world throughout history, people throughout history were believed in a higher power, believed in some sort of conception of religion. They had some sort of philosophy in regards to life, man, life in the universe, man's relationship to God. And what this did was that this naturally brought meaning into one's life because your now meaning was pegged in something transcend, trans, transcendent. It wasn't pegged yeah. upon uh, within sort of this, the human sphere. You, we be, people believe there was a higher power that created them and created them for a reason. So that they had ultimate meaning, which came from this. Their lives had a direction. And this is significant also, bro. I think it's a good point to touch upon this because one may turn around and say, well, what's the big deal with this whole ultimate meaning thing? Why do we need ultimate meaning? Right? Yeah. And I think this is it's, it's an important thing to touch upon because if you think about human experience, the way we function as human beings, we are meaning-driven creatures. We can't escape this, right? We see the world through the lens of meaning. So whether it's you know, th- think about our daily lives. When we wake from when we wake up in the morning to when we go to bed at night, every single step, everything we do, is with a meaning for a reason. There is a, from getting up, having breakfast, brushing your teeth, going to work, having lunch, coming home. Everything is meaning driven, right? And even when we design and make things as as humans, when we yeah. design products and stuff, it's always with a for there's a meaning behind it. There is a objective behind the things that we make. When we look at the world, when we do science, we study the world, we look at things through the lens of meaning, right? We want to understand the meaning behind things. Although from a from a scientific perspective, that's a we're looking for sort of empirical answers. Um, but nevertheless, we're always seeking meaning. Words, language itself, why is it so mm-hmm. powerful? Because it conveys meaning. So I mean, we are meaning-driven creatures. So it's inevitable and natural that we would ask the question about our own lives. Well, why do I exist? What's the mm-hmm. what's the meaning behind my existence? And when you find yourself adopting or holding onto a worldview or a position which can't provide answers to that question, it inevitably leads to, you know, anxiety, depression, frustration. And again, we'll unpack this as we go along. Don't digress too much. But going back, historically, people believed in God, 
had followed some type of religion way of life, which gave them ultimate meaning. It was during the period of the Enlightenment where you can say this was the one one point in our human history where there was a there was a huge shift as far as you know our cosmology was concerned. Yeah, uh, we went from believing in God and believing in the hereafter, which is you know believing in this sort of concept of true worlds as Nietzsche would refer to it as. You know that there is a the ultimate, the real life is to come. This is not the this is a temporary abode. We went from that type of thinking, and then through the sort of uh, the writings of the philosophers during the during the Enlightenment, we went to thinking, okay, no, this is the only world that exists. Now our objective is to attain a worldly utopia. We have to create paradise on earth. Progress, mm-hmm. yeah. progress is specifically material progress in this world. Um, you know, so that now this type of shift in focus which they were quite successful in achieving in the west um meant that you know the idea of god the idea of a hereafter were actually detrimental uh for material progress you mm-hmm. know and uh, yeah. um, and and they were successful in shifting people's focus moving away from christianity gradually and and you know this eventually uh, gave rise or created that fertile ground for for philosophies and ideologies such as atheism you know, naturalism and all of these other feminism, all of these different ideologies you see, see today, it created that fertile ground for such ideologies to sort of emerge from. Um, and that's why I don't believe atheism is, is the real problem. I think it the, fundamentally it's a problem of worldviews, how we perceive reality, mm-hmm. you know, um, which, which we, especially as Muslims, we need to consider. Because a lot of times what we're finding today, especially amongst the youth, you know, we may on one level identify with Islam and say, this is, I'm Muslim, I believe in Allah, I believe in all of these things. But on the other end, uh, just because of the, the world that we grow up in and the way that conditions us, we have a very so sort of post-enlightenment uh, mindset. And therefore, there's this sort of contradiction that, that exists within our lives and something we have to unpack if we are ready to sort of... Um, you know, really are to sort of be successful in this life and the hereafter. Hmm. And I, I think those are excellent points you mentioned, you know, about the factors that contribute to nihilism. Uh, the loss of God is definitely, I think, the largest one um, because, you know, God and religion is really the foundation for a just society. And many of our philosophers, even Western philosophers, have come to that realization, um, such as Napoleon. Napoleon once said that, you know, one of the best ways to stop, you know, thievery or robbery in a society is to have God because then you have somebody who's watching at all times. Um, but then again, you mentioned the excellent point that just because one has God doesn't necessarily make them uh, protect them completely from nihilism, right? And that's, that really has to do, like we'll go later on and mention, with faulty thinking and incorrect thinking about how God and how religion works. Um, but I think also another huge thing which contributed to nihilism was the First and Second World Wars. Um, there was an immense amount of suffering, immense amount of bombing that occurred, immense amount of tragedy, especially what happened to the Jews. And ultimately, this really World War II specifically gave rise to the problem of evil. It was mm-hmm. always it was always there in history, but with World War II, people really began to question why is God really doing this? And when mm-hmm. one really goes down that route completely, it the door the, the, the final door is really nihilism, isn't it? Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting because you have to look at the, the historical context here. Prior to the world wars taking place, you know the the foundations were already set. With the mindset was okay, worldly progress. You know we have to, and and you, one could argue, you know, it's this type of enlightenment philosophy which has led to a lot of the wars and destruction we see in the world today. Um, so it, it the, the 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 sort of foundations were already set. But what the world was like, you mentioned, what the, the First and Second World War did is it exposed people to sort of what they refer to as the irrational aspects of reality, mm-hmm. the sort of bloodshed and the corruption and the disorder and the chaos. And they couldn't, and this is why post, you know, World War One, World War Two, that was roughly the time where, you, where the existentialist philosophers became really prominent. They became very popular okay. um, because they were, the, they were the philosophers that tried to address these questions about life, the meaning of life, yeah. problem of evil, etc., um, and they, they came so, in the 20th yeah. century, many of them, like John Paul yes. Sartre. Yeah, okay, that yeah, makes yeah, sense. 20th century, yeah, 19th and 20th centuries, and, and this and, and this is why they gained so much popularity because mm. the, people wanted to make sense of the nature of the world, the disorder in the world. They wanted to make sense of life and the meaning of life in a world which was a post enlightenment, which they where the where they had already sort of turned away from God, the notion of God. 
Um, and that's why they became quite, you know, prevalent. And it's 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 interesting that, you know, the, the Enlightenment philosophers, unlike the sort of modern day new atheists, they were very quick to acknowledge that life without God is ultimately meaningless. Mm, yeah. So they started with that premise. And then they said, okay, now let's try to figure out how we can deal with this problem and make life, life meaningful in the absence of God. Uh -huh. uh, but unfortunately, the new atheists today, they then in most cases, they don't like addressing this question of the meaning of life. If they do, they don't have to answer it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's and, and and many some of them will still deny that life is at bottom ultimately meaningless in the absence of God. Um, so it's it's very interesting, and this is why I, quite, I I actually the more I read the existentialist philosophers, the more respect I have for for some at least some of them. Um, because they were obvious. Even Nietzsche, I mean, you know, yeah. when, when they use his uh, uh, famous or infamous, uh, uh, you know, parable of the madman in the gay mm -hmm. science, uh, you know, some of the atheists would say, look, you know, atheists declared that God is dead, uh, but they don't read and they don't understand the context of what's being said. Nietzsche was actually making people aware. And it's a very interesting passage if you read it. He was, he, you know, he was making people aware that, okay, you may have killed the concept of God, can but you can you, you give the analogy? Been, can you give the analogy again for those who yeah, don't know? It's it's it's, it's, a, it's a it's in the parable you have this this madman this crazy man that you know uh, comes rushing down into this uh, uh, into this town or city area and he's you know he's looking for God he's searching for God basically and he has a lantern and he's searching for God and and he's 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 asking where God is gone and he's you know he's making claims that you killed God you know the blood of the of the blood of the death of God is on your hands. You know, and, uh, you know, he's, he's asking profound questions. He's asking, well, you know, how could we how could we do this? How could we wipe away the sun with our own hands? And I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember the exact words. And then yeah. he goes on to say, you know, that we've unbound the earth from its sun. You know, and oh, where wow. are we going? Now? Up, down, we've, which direction are we moving in? Right. And it's interesting because he's highlighting through this parable that in the apps, once you turn away from God, you lose all direction. You know, you can't make sense of those most foundational questions we have as human beings, the meaning of life, morality, who am I? You know, all of these things go out the window. Mm -hmm. Because in the absence of God, if you say there is no God, there is no creator, right? Well, well what are you saying other, instead of that? What you're actually saying is, well, the entire universe and everything that exists, including us human beings, we are a result of just this one big accident, this cosmic accident which is, has no consciousness, no mind, no intention. It just happened, right? It's just like spilt milk. Yeah. And at least according to them, spilt milk has no purpose. It just happens. Yeah? It's just this unfortunate uh, you know, event that's taking place without any intention. So if we're just accidents and life is an accident and everything is an accident, well, then how can we claim meaning? How could it be meaningful? It's, it's everything, the universe, including us, our lives are ultimately meaningless. And therefore, we lose all direction, you know, and we've already discussed and mentioned how important meaning is to the human being. You know, it allows mm -hmm. us to function. It gives us a goal. It's, it allows us to move forward. Um, so in the absence of God, you have no meaning. You don't, we lose, we lose sense of who we are as human beings. And it reminds me of a very powerful ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَكُونُ كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَامْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِكُونَ That do not be like those who forgot Allah. And as a result, Allah made them forget themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and they are the ones who are the true transgressors. It's a very powerful ayah, you know, and um, Iqbal, uh, Ilama Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal, the poet from from Pakistan, uh, he, 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 you know, his whole philosophy, he had this very powerful philosophy on Khudi. Yeah. Um, his entire philosophy was based on this particular ayah of the Quran, you know, and I found that really interesting because he was someone that actually... You know, he was someone that had his finger on the pulse. He knew the condition uh -huh. of the world and the predominant ideologies and the direction people were going in. So it was really interesting that, you know, he, he recognized that. And it's true. If, if we think of you turn away from God, you know, you will lose your bearings. You won't know who you are. You don't you won't know who, why you exist. You know, so it's 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 it's, uh, you know, it's very powerful. If you think about it, that it's God is essential, you know, and we don't. And I think people today in the 21st century don't appreciate how important the concept of God is. And when I say the, the concept of the belief in God, I don't just mean acknowledging it just rationally and believing, okay, there is a God, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's far it's more profound. It's a whole profound way of being, right? It's a whole Absolutely. way of being.
Um, yep. And there's actually a line from Alama Iqbal. Um, um, I, ca I can't recall it, but it's something, maybe you know, it's something along the lines of um, Islam, is not, uh, Islam is not a set of beliefs, but rather it's a whole way of living. So I'm, yeah. I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what he, what he was saying. And it goes back to your point that if, if Islam just remains as this theoretical concept in your mind, which is never really enacted, which is never really Iman, then you're still susceptible to nihilism, uh, right? Absolutely. Because look, the, it, it's, I mean, let's practically sort of work through this and think about this. If you acknowledge there is God, you know, and, you know, even today, some academics would go as far as acknowledging that there is a cause, you know, a, a sort of deistic conception of God, but mm -hmm. he has nothing to do with the universe. There is something there. How does that help us? You know, if we think about it, you know, it, I mean, from the perspective of the meaning of life, why were we created? If you just acknowledge God exists, right, and that's it, and you don't then follow through with that and, you know, try to understand what this created, this cause. Has he revealed something? If he's revealed something, has he told us why we exist? If he's told us why we exist, then has he told us how to now try to fulfill that objective and purpose in our lives? If he's mm -hmm. told us that, are we living by it? You know, exactly. because yeah. otherwise it doesn't make sense on a human level. I mean, on you want to know what the meaning of life is. God tells you what the meaning of life is, as Allah says in the Quran. And again, it's it's you know something maybe we can discuss. That Allah tells us He created us to worship. Right? We can unpack this a bit, but He created us to know Him and to worship Him. Okay, now are you doing that? Because if you're not doing that, well, then you're still in a position of nihilism, right? Because exactly. you're not helping yourself. So it's exactly. it's and I think that's where we fall a lot of young Muslims today, which is we may acknowledge it, um, but we don't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think, yeah, and, and, and I think that that has something to do with um, the influence that the Judeo-Christian narrative has had on us, particularly Christianity, where um, Christianity doesn't necessarily have the laws that something like Islam or Judaism has, and it's more about just kind of just this belief that you have, and. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Enlightenment period is during the Enlightenment period, Christianity really becomes like a form of deism. So you see many people, many of the philosophers, uh, people like Napoleon, they start becoming deists. And deism is the belief that there is a God, but that he's not involved in the affairs of the world. Whereas, you know, the Islamic understanding is God is, and God is behind everything that's going on. So I think a lot of these ideas have seeped into our minds, given that we're living in the West, given that there's globalization and people forget that with globalization, all of the world has the same problems at the same time. Um, and so I think, I think, I think the, these are things, but there's one thing I really want to focus on, bro, which I think is really one of the things that's at the heart of nihilism is that today we live in an age where we're kind of, and this is again with these modern developments in science is that we are told that human beings are nothing. You know, uh, at my university, we had this, we had this observatory and on the floor, there was um, mathematical signs uh, explaining the size of things. So it would say like 10 to the power of one, it would say like a human. And they would say 10 to the power of two, it would say like this campus. And it would say 10 to the power of three, the country. Ten, and it would just go to like 10 to the power of 20. And while reading that, you just realize that you're, you're nothing. You're insignificant. And I was just, uh, I was on Twitter the other day and there was this ex-Muslim account tweeting that, you know, from the from the Jupiter, Earth looks like a tiny dot. Yet human beings think they're so that they're so powerful that they're so that, that that God has honored them, right? There's a principle in philosophy called I think it's called uh, the anthropomorphic principle or something, um, which states that it's one theory that the Earth is at the center of the universe, right? That the, the Earth is the center of all of creation. But there, there's a saying from Ali radiAllahu anhu, which I think beautifully encapsulates this whole situation where he says, you think that you're insignificant in the grand scheme of the cosmos, but you don't realize that the cosmos are within you, right? That you're the center. You're the, you're the center of the universe, not in a physical way, but in a metaphorical way. And that Allah has honored us and has created us as caliphs on the earth. So I think when we have this paradigm shift and we start looking at things the way that the Islamic tradition tells us, we realize that we are the Khalifa of the earth and we're not something that is, you know, despicable or something that's meant to be dishonored. 
And Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam." Right? We have honored the children of Adam. And I think that's a huge proof. And any anybody listening to this should really take that away that Allah has said that he has honored all of us. And the honoring that Allah has given to us is not something that we should really discard and remind ourselves as how, how you know, feeble that we are. Absolutely, bro. It's a beautiful point. And the funny thing is, it's on, on one end, they, from a purely materialistic perspective, you know, the human is rendered down to just a, a biological machine, essentially, mm-hmm. just a, a highly evolved animal, right? So they, they reduce the human from, from one perspective. And on the other end, if you look at it from a sort of more of a sort of social perspective, the sort of modern mindset, this postmodern mindset is, you know, you, essentially you are your own God. You know, so you have the power and ability to manifest whatever you want in your life, and all of these sort of new age philosophies, and and it's, that's one. That's what the world's doing. It's this. It's this. It's this. Uh, this desire to attain and acquire as much as they can to take control and power. This is what runs the world. It's all about power. You know, it's yeah. all about control. So there's this interesting dichotomy there that the 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 modern sort of uh, West in particular is dealing with, where you know materialistically you're just a highly evolved animal on the other end you 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 know you're your own god you're your own creator but islam gives a very beautiful and profound uh, perspective on this that you as a human being uh you know as insignificant as you are from one perspective you know you are the creation of god and you have a soul you know so we don't have this purely materialistic philosophy you know it, from an islamic perspective you are body and soul you know so you have mm-hmm. these both elements that make you as a human being you have the physical element and you have the spiritual element and you can, and also we, we, we are told that you can develop yourself as a human being and elevate yourself, you know, as a human being through effort and through worshipping God to the point where you can reach ranks higher than the angels. You know, and that's, a, that's something profound. Whereas you don't have this in the absence of Islam. All we have today, today's uh, hedonistic culture is, well, you only live once, this YOLO mentality, go do what you want. Just enjoy mm. yourself, have fun, you know, and, and, you know, just do whatever you like. Knock yourself out, basically, right? And mm-hmm. it's, but it's not working. It's, it's, I mean, if you look at it, it's, it's not working because people are suffering. You know, people are, especially you see this all the time, rich and affluent people who have a lot of money, a lot of wealth, mm. they're not happy, you know, because, yeah. and, and it shows, this shows that we weren't designed to feed off materialism or the material world. Sure, aspects of the material may satisfy the human on a certain level, uh, but you have a spiritual self that requires nourishment as well. And mm-hmm. you're not going to get that again in the absence of God. So it's and Islam provides that beautiful balance where on one end it doesn't deny you the material. It doesn't say become a monk, go into a cave, yeah. you know, run away from everything, the entire world. You can have the world within balance, within proportion. But at the same time, you know, you're told what the higher objective is, which is that spiritual development to purify the soul, you know, to, to find your creator, to connect with him, to, and then eventually attain paradise. So it's a very profound cosmology that Islam offers—a way of looking at life, and 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 who our creator is, and it's a beautiful balance, bro. Because, you know what? Again, going just slightly going back for a second, one of the reasons the Enlightenment movement actually took off was because the the Christian West, the people in the West, had suffered for centuries, you know, at the hands of the Christian Church from the perspective of progress. You know, it was it was all about giving up the material completely. You know, mm-hmm. not this. You know, we, we many stories. I mean, mashallah, you studied the history, Galileo, and many others that were persecuted for bringing new ideas. You know, to the table. So, and what the Enlightenment, what happened during the Enlightenment, they finally turned away from this and broke free in a way. And it made sense from their perspective, going from Christianity to being free now to be able to explore the world, explore the universe, do science, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the Islamic world never had the same problem because mm-hmm. the, the Muslim world understood that they, because the base was the Quran and the Islamic tradition, they understood the beautiful balance. You know, that it's that there is a spiritual dimension to the material. You know, that we are to progress. Go study the world. Allah encourages you to do this in the Quran. You know, study the world because all of it's a sign of the creator. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's, there was a beautiful balance between the two uh, from the Islamic perspective. Obviously, the Islamic civilization declined for other reasons, but the West never really became aware of this, this beautiful balance that Islam provided, you know, between the material and the spiritual, uh, which mm-hmm. can't be couldn't be found anywhere else. 
And, and, you know, I, I think a lot of, you know, when we talk about the relationship between religion and science and can the two come together, um, this is really something that emerges from the Christian West. It's not something the Islamic civilization had. And if you read, for example, 1001 Inventions by National Geographic, they state, you know, in their chapter of astronomy, they said the Muslim development in astronomy was solely from Islam. And that Islam had forced Muslims to, one, understand the prayer times. So they needed to understand astronomy because the times of Salah really depend on the movement of the sun. They said, two, when the Muslims began to expand, they needed to know the direction of Qibla. And so then they needed to figure out, okay, where's the Qibla? And then third, Allah commanded them that everything in the cosmos is a sign and everything needed to be reflected upon. And they took that to understand what is, you know, what are the stars? Why are they in that specific position? And so I think the relationship of these two, it, it really emerges from the Christian idea. It's not something we have in our civilization. But, you know, now that we're talking about meaning, um, I want to ask you about a quote that you mentioned in your Sapiens Institute video. It's a quote from uh, Viktor Frankl, um, who wrote the famous Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and Viktor Frankl, for those who don't know, um, he is a massive thinker in psychology and he created his own school called Logotherapy, which aimed to bring meaning within people's lives to remove their emotional disturbances and nihilism. This is something that Professor Dr. Malik Badri in his book, The Dilemma of the Muslim Psychologist, um, mentions as one of the cures for, uh, for, uh, for the nihilistic problem that we're in. But he says, quote, he says, for too long, we have been dreaming a dream from which we are now waking up. The dream that if we just improve the socioeconomic situation of people, everything will be okay and people will become happy. The truth is that as the struggle for survival has subsided, the question has emerged, survival for what? Ever more people today have the means to live, but no meaning to live for. The truth is that man does not live by welfare alone. And I want you to tie this in with this uh, beautiful concept you call the depressed king. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like materially, we we have more today than ever before. You know, we live. We the the the, the average person. I mean, yourself, myself, we have, you know, some of the amenities and luxuries that the kings of the past had. You know, so it's consumerism has allowed for almost well, not everyone, but a good proportion of the world to have the basic needs met um so it's it's one especially in the west at least once you have this you attain this it's like okay i've been i thought this is where happiness lies and when you start mm -hmm. when you acquire it and then you start thinking well it's not it's not doing the job something's still missing you know there's still a void and it's interesting because especially during the covid uh pandemic over the past couple of years what's really interesting is because people have been cut away from their daily lives and what they were used to doing, the routine, they've, they've, they've been at home and most people have had time to sit down and think about the bigger mm -hmm. questions of life. And it's, it's, it's been a very interesting sort of time because a lot the rates of depression and anxiety have gone through the roof. You know? And it's, if you look at the research on this, it's not only because people are afraid uh, of the virus and, and, and what it may do and how if it may affect someone. That is a, a, a part of it. But it's also because people just don't know. People have been thinking about these existential questions. You know, what is it all about? Why do we exist? Um, and there's been studies on this, you know, where, where I think, I don't remember, a few years ago, I came across this where some businessmen were taken and they were taken out of the daily routines and they were made to sit in a room for, I think, a day uh, or a certain period of time. And some of them almost went crazy. <laughs> because wow. they, they, they people <laughs> and this is this is what's really interesting we live in a world today it's like you know if you see the matrix you 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 get this parable it's like we're, we're overdosing on the blue pill basically yeah it's people people are literally the world is designed in a way to keep you plugged in where you're constantly busy doing things which are of material interest which are you know making the cogs turn as far as the, the material system is concerned you know mm -hmm. so you're you're a part of that system. It's like it's like a mouse on a wheel, basically. You're just busy, busy, mm -hmm. busy doing everything you need to do. But when those moments come where those windows of opportunity, where you're cut off from all of that, where you have to sit and think about life and your existence and the bigger questions, people break down because mm -hmm. we, they, we, most people are holding on to a worldview 
that does not allow for them to find answers to these questions. Mm. You know, atheism. Yeah. You, you know, I'll tell you something interesting. There's a quote from a famous mathematician named Pascal. And he said, all of the problems in the world exist because man is too terrified to sit alone in his room with his thoughts. Uh, and, very profound quote. <laughs> and there's, you know, I've had people come to me where they've said, you know, I'm so scared to be alone with myself that when I'm in my car, I'm listening to music. When I'm inside my house, I have earphones in. When I'm studying, I'm listening to music. And when I'm sleeping, I'm also listening to music because I'm so terrified of just being alone with my thoughts and having to confront them. And I think this ties in exactly to what you're saying, subhanAllah, about during the COVID age, people have really been forced to sit in their room for, it's been two years now. And they've really been forced to ask many of these questions. And I think there's two things that are happening now because people are forced in this situation. One, um, I mean, th there's two results to this contemplation. One is ultimately it, it makes one realize that there is a greater purpose to my life, something that I had been lacking for many years. And so I know of people who've quit their nine to five jobs and have now begun to pursue that which they find meaningful. Then you have the other extreme who from all of this just only gets worse and, and is now developing anxiety, all this fear and nihilism has increased now. And you're right that all the statistics have shown this, but you know, the point, the point is, is that people have lost the ability for introspection. And I believe it was, um, it might've been Pascal or it might've been Nietzsche, or it might've been one of the enlightenment philosophers, but they said that uh, during, you know, the ancients would go into solitude, for spiritual refinement. But in today's age, solitude is used as a torture technique. Subhanallah. Uh, it's so true, bro. It's like we've lost the capacity to, uh, one, the sort of willingness and courage to sit and think and reflect upon our own lives. I mean, how often do we do that? Even as Muslims, how often do we take some time out and just sit and think about our lives? And, and you know, how, how we're doing? How was the past six months? Am I progressing? You know, and these are important things. People have, again, done this throughout history. It's only a modern phenomenon where people just don't have the time to do this and don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to have the courage to do this because otherwise you'll never be fully fulfilled. You'll always have, you know, your, the, the body, the way Allah has created us is, is a very, it's, it's amazing. You know, we have in, built in mechanisms to help us realize something's wrong. Something needs to be addressed. Depression, anxiety, in many cases, bro, um, it, it, they, they are signs. I mean, some, if you look at some of the psychological research, they, they are, it, it's not something wrong with you. It's almost like an internal mechanism telling you something needs to be addressed, something you're mm -hmm. overlooking, something you're pushing aside. Um, so these are friends. I mean, that's how we should see these things, you know. So it, it, people need to start doing this. So one, we have to have the courage to start doing this again. And secondly, it's like we have to, I don't know what it is, man. We we have to find it in ourselves to ask ourselves the question, how should I live? You know, because, I mean, if you don't think about it, you'll live one way or the other, right? You, you, mm. you, you, you have to exist. While you're on this earth, you're experiencing serial time, you're living through the days, the moments, the hours, you're going to live one way or the other. But how should you live? That's mm. a powerful question, bro, because we have to realize we have the ability to not only grapple with that question, but to actualize our lives after we reflect upon that question. And we, we, we have the ability Allah has given us to direct ourselves, mm. you know. And we, we have to exercise this because we have to remember, especially as Muslims, once this time is gone, you're not getting it back. It's gone, yeah. right? And Allah speaks about the people in the Quran that on the day of judgment, they'll be biting their hands and fingers because, you know, all wishing they could go back you know, and, and change their condition. But it's too late. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Allah has given us this knowledge of the future within the Quran because it's coming from the all knowing creator. So, I mean, and we should uh -huh. reflect upon this and think, you know, I don't want to, even as a Muslim, I don't want to end up in the position of regret. You know, and, and for us not to end up there, we have to really sit down and grapple with the question, how should I live? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's a very important question, especially in the times that we live in. Because if you don't do that, there's someone out there that's dictating how you should be living your life. And how majority of the people in the West yeah. are living living their lives, you know? So you have to ask yourself the question, do you just want to be a sheep and that follows along? Or do you want to really, you know, be someone that actually takes control of their life and makes... And that's, saying all this doesn't mean you're going to get it right straight away, right? Everyone falls short. 
We all make mistakes. We'll have to sort of get up again, recollaborate, go again. But these are the things that are going to make life meaningful. You know, it's it's not just living mindlessly uh, in accordance with the way you've been told to live. You know, it's, that's not what it's about, mm-hmm. especially for a Muslim. You know, we have, we should be thinking, okay, wow, opportunity. Allah created me. He, he made me human. You know, he allowed me to understand that Islam is the truth at a very young age. You know, this is a big opportunity for me to not only rectify myself, but leave something substantial behind. You know, and, and it's having such big goals, which, again, makes life meaningful. And meaning, bro, you know, functions on many different levels. So, and I think it's good to clarify this because it's such a big topic, meaning of life. What's the meaning of your life? What's the purpose? You have this sort of baseline, the bare bottom. What is the, alt- it's, it's almost like, why were you created type of meaning? What is, yeah. what is the reason for your existence? You know, why do you exist? That is fundamentally a religious question. No matter how intelligent you are, you could be a genius. You'll never find the answer to that question because you didn't create yourself or bring yourself into being. Right? So mm-hmm. it's not going to come from you. That and that Allah answers in the Quran. That He did not create us for any other reason except to know Him and to worship Him. That is the reason for our existence. And then Allah further clarifies: Okay, the next level up is why do I exist in this reality I call the world? Right. Where there's you know there's a set number of hours in the day and there's a night and then there's a set number of years I live. Why in this world? Allah tells us in Surah Mulk that He created life and death to test which of us is best in deeds. You know, so it's essentially the fundamental test is: Are you going to recognize your Creator? Are you going to mm-hmm. do what's good as opposed to what's bad when you're faced with a choice? You know, so it, we, we we're literally exercising our worship of our Creator within this world. Because choices, continuously we're facing choices. Every moment of our existence is a choice between mm-hmm. a couple of things, you know, a few things, whatever it is, we're always making choices. Making the right choice, being conscious of Allah, what will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, even if it means sacrificing on my part, sacrificing things that I may desire. So that's another level. Why do I exist in this world? Allah answers that question. Then there is another level, which is, what is the meaning I want to, what are the goals? Let's say goals for now. What, what are the goals I want to give my life? What are the goals mm-hmm. I want to have within life? Which tie, which sort of link in to the ultimate meaning of my life, which is worshipping Allah, right? Because, I mean, sometimes as Muslims, we get caught up on this. Okay, I need to worship. You know, Allah told me, created me to worship Him. Yeah, well, that doesn't just mean praying five times a day. That's only going to take, what, say, 20 minutes of your time every day. What about mm-hmm. the 23 and a half hours that are remaining? Or say, you know, minus eight hours. Yeah. The 16, 17, 18 hours of your day. You know, if, if you, your life, Allah's told you, you're, you're, the reason for your existence is to worship Him. Okay. Now, how are you going to exercise that in those 16, 17, 18 hours in the day? You know? Mm. And this is where you have that sort of sphere of creativity that Allah's opened up to you as an intelligent, rational human being, where you can now think, okay, what are the skills that I have? What are the abilities Allah's given? You know, what are the potentials Allah's given? You know, and really start to now say, you know what, Allah, I'm going to do, I have these skills and these traits and these abilities you've given me. Now I'm going to use these and I'm going to do as the, use them to the best of my ability for your sake. That could exactly. be, I don't know, writing. That could be studying a subject. That could be helping someone, doing charity work, whatever it is, whatever comes to you. You know, this, and this is a blessing from Allah. This is where you can express yourself as an individual human being. In your worship of Allah. You know, because mm-hmm. there's those foundations that we have, the pillars and everything. We, we all do those. But then there's this whole sphere where you can express yourself as a human being, you know, mm-hmm. and really live out, you know, the khalifa of Allah on earth to the best of your ability. And again, so this is, this and if you, if you can hit all of these levels of meaning in your life or try to, I mean, that, I don't know what else is going to make for a meaningful life other than that, bro, you know, because mm-hmm. in the absence of that, if you look at it from the from a godless perspective, a non-Islamic perspective, an atheist, naturalist, secular perspective, well, what do you have? Let's think about it. Okay, I am an accident. I've, I just came into existence, and I'm going to die. Well, maybe I should. I have this. I, I, even atheists recognize they have this internal, you know, ethical urge, which is again, Allah's embedded that within every yeah. fitra, every human soul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, maybe I should be good and do good and do charity work. You know, and sure, I'm not denying this. This can give people meaning on that third level, on that sort of most, uh, the most simple level, which is they don't, they may not understand the existence of their life is or the meaning behind the existence, but they may do something or tell themselves, my purpose is to do charity work, my purpose is to build a hospital, or, you know, do X, Y, and Z. And this will make their life worthwhile on a level. But if you really think about it, 
they're just making this up for themselves because at bottom life is ultimately meaningless it's an accident mm-hmm. you know and you're tell- you're just telling yourself i have to do charity work and that's what's going to make my life meaningful but well, you just made that up you know exactly so, I mean, and if that gets you by well that's that's great you know all power to you but at the end of the day if you really sit and think about it it's all fruitless at the end of the day because you're going to die and it's and, and you're gone you know according mm-hmm. to them there's nothing that carries on when your body dies it decomposes and you're finished um so i mean and as muslims we should reflect upon this the reason i mention this bro is because a lot of times we become complacent with what allah has given us you know we just think it's we just think it's something yeah whatever you know we don't value it and mm-hmm. one of the reasons we don't value it because we don't understand the opposite. We don't understand what life is like in the absence of Allah, you know, in the exactly. absence of religion. So if you can really think about that and start to really appreciate what Allah has given us and value it, then maybe that's going to help us help propel us on that that trajectory where we mm. really start living according to Islam. And you know, it, it reminds me of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It's 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 that pyramid, and he begins at the bottom. He said the the most important thing that human needs is food, right? Something to eat. Then the second level, he says, is security, right? The idea to be protected. But like at the top, the highest level is meaning, right? Yeah. And that's something all of us should really be striving for. And I think what COVID really has done is COVID has forced people to really think about this subject deeply. And, you know, to, you know, I, to just give an example with myself, you know, when COVID, and I'm sure, you know, maybe you or other people can relate, but when COVID hit, I went through somewhat of a crisis because, all of the work that I had been doing that had been giving me meaning involved being in person and several months had passed and I was just stuck at home and I wasn't able to do, you know, the MSA work that I was doing, the charity work that I was doing, the humanitarian work. And I really went through a crisis where I was like, I've lost that meaning in my life. The thing that was kind of giving me that drive. And ultimately when things started opening up, I started doing work, but that moment was actually the moment that inspired me to start the podcast because I realized that just because there was a, there was a lockdown going on doesn't mean the work stops. And the moment I started doing it, all of that meaning came back and arguably even at a higher level. So I think, you know, the, the, the point that you're highlighting is beautiful that all of us really should take this moment to try to figure out what gives us meaning because I'm me personally, I make a distinguishing between the purpose of one's life and the meaning of one's life. I think the purpose of one's life is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to know him, but the meaning of one's life is what one person does outside, you know, uh, you know, is, is what one person does in their career or whatever that gives them that drive that gives them that reason of why they want to wake up because you know, what is it going to, you know, there's a beautiful line. Uh, you know, I actually got this from you, subhanAllah. Um, in Iqbal's um, Iblis Ki Majlis Shura, right? The Devil's Advisory Council. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it, for those who don't know, it's that um, it's a meeting between the devil, between all the devils. And uh, one of the things that he says is, you know, look at all the corruption that's going on in the world. Look at how I made nationalism so prominent and look how beautiful it is. But then he responds, he's like, you know, there's one thing I fear. And it's those people who wake up, you know, late in the night to go make wudu and pray their salah. And it's like, what, what is the thing that causes you to wake up every morning? And if you really don't have that drive, that meaning, and there's no point in getting up out of bed, then you can just sit there all day. So if you don't have that meaning, if you haven't really pursued that, then this is really a moment because I know my, I know my audience. YouTube tells me the age of my audience. You know, it's largely 20 to 34 um, this is an incredible time in one's life where one really has the opportunity to go do whatever they want. And while this opportunity is still there, we should really be snatching it before it's taken away from us. Absolutely, bro. It's fun. You know, it's, and this is it. This is the, like the way I like picturing it sometimes. One thing you can do is like, you know, you have a, you have your wardrobe and you have your clothes, right? And in many cases we hang our clothes on hangers. Right? So you have a hanger and you put your jacket on it. You have to see it like that. Your ultimate meaning, which Allah has told you, created you to worship him. Right? That's like the hanger. And then the clothes you put on top of it, it's like the, the, the specific goals and meaning ah. you put in your life. Always attach it to the hanger. Right? Because that's what makes it substantial. Because now you're, yeah. every goal and aspiration and everything you set your mind to in this world to make your life meaningful, you're always linking it back to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, and that's what makes it so uh-huh. significant. You know, and like you said, Iqbal mentioning that those that wake up, shaitan fed those that wake up in the morning. 
you know, to make the wudu and pray. I mean, if you just think about that, they, because because that human being is making the sacrifices he needs to make in his life to connect with the ultimate reality. And the power and strength and energy that's going to come from that, which is then going to manifest in your entire life and everything you do, that's what's going to make shaitan you know, run. Because mm. the human has huge potential, but we can never maximize the potential unless we are connected to our creator. You know, and and this is why it's so so especially for young Muslims, you know, today in the 21st century, a lot of bro, I get this I, so many times. You know, I've I've spoken to Muslims. They pe people are lost. Muslims are lost. They're confused. Yeah, and I, on one level, you can't blame them because it's just the environment we're a part of. Mm. You know, everything is confusing. Anything goes. You know, and it's very hard. It's like the Prophet Sallam said, there'll come a time when holding on to your deen, and I'm paraphrasing, but holding on to your deen will be like holding on to hot coals. You know, and that's a very powerful metaphor if you think about it. And I mean, if it's not these times, I don't know which times they are because we live in those times now where it's so difficult for people to hold on to their deen, right? But people need to start seeing it in a positive. Even if you could just try it, make that effort to realize the, the value of what Allah has given us. And try to connect to Allah, and then do something substantial for His sake in this world. I mean, that's where where your where your life's going to become worthwhile, and you're going to get over all of that confusion and all of that sort of, you know, the, all of those clouds. Because mm -hmm. it, otherwise, you know, Shaitan is always there. Yeah, and if you let him get to you, he'll get to you. You know, and exactly. a lot of people have doubts, right? And I mean, one thing one thing you see with people with doubts in many cases, they have one doubt. You answer that question, then they have another doubt. Yeah. It's just a vicious cycle because they've got themselves into this pattern. The way, the best way to break out of that is is just, you know, say what's what is natural is going to happen. Yeah. So why should I give it any power by sitting down and thinking about what's being said to me in my head? Because the more you spend time you spend with it, the more power you give it and the more it's going to take you over and your life. And mm -hmm. the more it's going to burn you out. Is there? It's natural. I have more important things to do. Just go do wudu, connect with Allah. Start to make your relationship with Allah more meaningful. You know, by being sincere to Allah to the best of your ability. And then start saying, okay, I believe in, I'm going to start setting some goals. I'm going to start doing some productive things in my life. You know, I'm going to start being responsible for my life and doing some, you know, things that I've been overlooking. And it could be simple things, right? Exactly. And when you start living like this, you won't have time for doubts. They'll disappear, you know? Mm -hmm. the, the, the solution to doubts isn't sitting there and spending time with them. It's it's not in more because in most ca most cases, bro, these doubts are just they're just ridiculous. They just make no sense if you really sit mm -hmm. down and think about it. So it's it's again it's we need to I think the way so I guess we're coming near the, the you know I don't know how long long you have, bro, but we're coming to the maybe to the close of the show. But one of the areas the things I wanted to talk about is okay, how do we now practically give young Muslims uh, you know the tools and the ability to be able to sort of take what we've been talking yeah. about. And 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 just and take it as a package and start to sort of make those changes basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think we need to do is is I refer to it as the core basically. Yeah? Get your core right, uh, and the core basically is really sit with by yourself, take some time out, and remind yourself of who you are in relation to your Creator. You know, go through that story again. I mean, Allah created you, and you were created to know Him and to worship Him. You know. Really understand that concept. What does that mean? Sit and think about it. Ponder over the Quran. You know, because we don't. Again, we don't do this. We read the Quran. We may recite it beautifully, but then you know, in most cases, we don't even know what Allah said. You know, and this is one of those really big pet peeves for me, bro. It's just I, I don't. I, it's look, I know. You know, we know there's reward in reciting the Quran, right? And and reciting it in a beautiful way and trying and struggling with it because there's even more reward if you struggle with it. Yeah. But to read the Quran and to recite the Quran every single day and not know what you've recited or what Allah has said to you, I don't know, for me, something doesn't add up there, bro. Because we know Allah has told us in the Quran that this is guidance for humanity. How are these words going to guide you if you don't know what's being said, what the meaning mm -hmm. of those words is, right? Exactly. So start doing one of two things. Number one, either get a translation when you recite, read the translation of what you recited. And spend some time pondering over that translation and thinking about what Allah said and how it applies to your life. And secondly, as a goal, another goal for yourself is start to engage with the Arabic language to the extent where you can start to understand the Quran directly in the Arabic. Right? And and I mean it, it takes time, but start doing that. 
it's a journey and it's, it's a very meaningful journey to, to sort of partake in engage with the Quran, connect with the Quran in a meaningful way so read it, understand what Allah is saying ponder over the ayat of the Quran what Allah is saying and see how it relates to your life what, what lessons do you take for your immediate life your, your, mm-hmm. your day how are you going to so internalize that and use that in your day and start living by it you know start living by it um, and then after that once you sort of build up some strength in yourself and your relationship with Allah then start to sort of ex- extend out a bit okay now what can I bring and you notice this you'll find the energy in yourself you know what can I bring to the world what can I do for people exactly you know, so but we have to start this process and it's going to take sacrifice, you know. Mm-hmm. One of the, and trust me, I've fallen into this. Everyone falls into this time again, you know, where you become weak at times. You know, you start giving into your desires. You start doing things which you know aren't right. You move away from Allah. If you find yourself in that position, it's fine. It's not too late. You're still alive. You know, get back up. Start to fix those things again, you know, because if we don't fix ourselves, we can't fix anything else. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's so important to really fix yourself. And I mean, uh, other than that, bro. I mean, w- we live in a world which, if you if you if you leave yourself to the world, it will tear you up. It will yeah. destroy you. You know. So we have to really take control of our lives and become responsible from that perspective. And you know, an excellent point that uh, I think all of us should really ponder is that you know, and you you you've articulated this beautifully. Is that you know, if you don't, you know, a lot of people they grow up, they want to change the world, um, but. In, in the process of that, they become changed by the world, right? And that's really the unfortunate thing is many people set out to remove many of these problems within our society. And to remove these problems, we need, you know, people who are journalists, people who are academics, uh, but people who are spiritually grounded, right? Who have the core, like you mentioned, right? But the problem is you go out there, it's just so difficult, especially living in these societies with all these ideas that are being brought out to you. It's very easy, even with the right niya, you go the wrong way. And it's it's quite profound that the beginning of the Quran, right? On, on the second page of the Quran, Allah says um, uh, that uh, those people who want to, you know, uh, th- when the people of corruption are asked, you know, why are you doing that? They're saying, you know, we're here to fix the world. But, they don't, re- but they don't realize that they're the ones actually causing corruption, right? So. Absolutely. Having the good intention is obviously fundamental. It's necessary, but also being aware, you know, really thinking and questioning, you know, really questioning yourself whenever you're doing things is, is this the best method to do it? But like you mentioned, whatever skills, you know, a person has within their life, you know, to figure out what one really wants to do, it's not something that will happen overnight, right? That if you're really looking for that thing that will bring meaning in one's life, it's going to require, like Pascal said, that introspection. That's sitting alone. And I mean, you know, one of the things people make fun of today, bro, is, uh, and it bothers me because I do it, is journaling, right? People look down on it and they say, oh my God, you like, you journal. That's such, that's such a weird thing to do. But they don't realize that journaling is how one comes to know their self. And there's a famous saying, it's, it's not a hadith, it's a fabricated hadith, but one of the scholars said it, that man, man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbu, that the one who knows himself will know his Lord. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned a beautiful ayat um, about uh, those who forgot God. God makes them forget themselves. There's another ayat that says, That the real losers are those who've lost themselves. Um, and knowing oneself is something that transcends, you know, a, a society. You know, Aristotle talked about it. The ancient Chinese civilization. Everywhere you go, they know the idiom, know yourself. But... What exactly did they mean and how did they think that one could acquire it? For many of them, they felt that solitude and introspection, but also a lot of them also felt that the relationship with their creator. And so um, we mentioned previously on one of our previous podcasts, uh, one, one brother was asked by somebody, how do I begin my spiritual journey? And he responded, he said, start spending some alone time with yourself. <laughs> it's, fun. It's, it's so true, bro. It's like, and again, it boils down, it, we, we, it's like we're spoiled in a way in the, the world that we live in, the way that we're brought up, where, you know, making sacrifices is something we don't want to do. You know, we just don't want to give up anything, you know, f- uh, and change our lives in any way. But at the same time, we want things to change. And it's it's almost like this balance. Like, you really want to change as a person, but at the same time, you don't want to sacrifice the things you know you need to sacrifice to change as a person. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it really depends. Again, again, introspection, you have to sit down and ask yourself, 
is it worth it? You know, is it worth me selling my soul for these couple of things that I really enjoy doing, you know, doing? But again, when you read the Quran and you read the stories of the prophets, I mean, their lives were all about sacrifice. They gave up things, you know. They, I mean, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, subhan, just think about the sacrifices this man made. I mean, he leaving his family in the middle of a desert, you know, I mean, that, that takes something. Taking you, you're almost slaughtering his son. That I mean, the, you you just think it just makes you think that the caliber of that man and, and his connection and his awareness of his creator it was just something we can't even imagine, you know. Wow. And but it's it's those sacrifices which change the world, literally change the world. You know, the sacrifice of the Prophet oh, You know, the sacrifices he made is what changed the world. And again, it's it's. It's just it's this delusion that this sacrifice is very painful and you're just going to lose everything. Because Shaitan comes to you, he's like, you're going to sacrifice this? You're not going to do this? It's going to be painful. You're going to be depressed. You're going to be sad. You know, you're mm-hmm. going to be in anxiety when you give this up. And he scares you from doing it. But by not doing it, he's just pushing you further and further down into a hole, mm-hmm. which is going to be harder and harder to get out of eventually. Exactly. So it's about saying, you know what? I have it in me. Because Allah told me I have it in me. You know, Allah tells in the Quran, He created us in the best of forms, you know, mm-hmm. before we render ourselves to a lower position. So we just need to gather our stuff up inside and just say, you know what, I'm going to make that change. It's going to exactly. be difficult initially, but I'm going to do it. And and then when you start, when you make that first move towards Allah, bro, I mean, the rest, I mean, is something that needs to be experienced. Subhanallah. When you make that initial sacrifice and you make that first step towards Allah, then you will see Allah do things in your life which are going to be nothing short of a miracle for you personally, you know, and 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 that's when you're going to start feeling alive again and feeling like, yeah, okay, now I realize what it mean what it means to feel alive, you know, not just mm-hmm. physically alive where my body's functioning, but alive as far as my soul is breathing, you know, and, and and we lose this, you know, a lot of times. But again, it's it's up to us. That's what we have to remember. We have to take control. It, it's up to us. It's our choice while we're alive. Mm-hmm. And you know, just 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 on a on a closing note. There's something we've mentioned, uh, I mentioned in one of our previous podcasts is the beautiful story of Imam al-Ghazali, where Imam al-Ghazali was the great scholar of his age, but he realized that there was some, his, his intention was not right and that he had some pride within him. And he realized it was getting really bad. And he said, I need to go on a journey. I need to completely abandon everything, abandon my beautiful post as being the, you know, the biggest professor of the, uh, of the school. And he said, I would take one step out, like I would take one step forward saying, I'm going to, you know, leave everything. But the devil would conv- convince me to bring my foot back in. And the way he would convince me is he would say, are you really going to give up your, you know, all, you have all these followers. You're the biggest scholar here. Um, you're, are you really going to give up your position for what reason? And so he said, I was stuck in the struggle where, you know, every day I'd, in the morning, I would say, I'm going to leave. And then by night, I'm like, no, I'm going to stay. And then finally, what happened is he gave his famous speech and his voice disappeared. And, and he went to the doctor and he said to the doctor, you know, why can't I speak? What's going on? And the doctor examined his entire body. And the doctor said, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do here. And Imam al-Ghazali says, what do you mean? You're a doctor, you're a physician. And he says, I'm sorry, but the problem is not a problem of the body, but one of the heart. And it was at that moment Imam Ghazali knew he needed to go on his journey. And that journey is ultimately what gave him that spiritual refinement, but also gave him that meaning. So for all of us, it's very difficult to make that first step because many of us know what that step is, right? Many of us know what we actually want to do, but we see, you know, we hear the the whispers of shaitan and the whispers convince us, you know, to maybe push it off until later or maybe tell us it's a bad idea. But when one spends that solitude with himself, and really thinks about these things deeply, they realize that this is what they're meant to do. Absolutely, bro. It's fun. You know, and and there's, there's, you know, there's things that need to be done. You know, as It's an opportunity for us as Muslims in the times that we live in, that people need to hear the message of Islam. You know, the crises the West is suffering from, which I believe one of the biggest crises is the crisis of meaning. Uh, you know, it's, it, people need to hear the message. But before we go and do that, we have to start to or try to find that for ourselves you know and and once we do then we then there's a 
huge opportunity to gain immense reward, you know, by Allah and, and do something significant in your life. But it's mm. just we have to start with ourselves, you know, and it, it, it takes sacrifice. But it's in the in the long run, it's worthwhile. It's going to pay off, you know. Mm. Um, and yeah, man, it's, 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 it's like, like you mentioned in the story of Imam al-Ghazali. I mean, that, that is a beautiful example. And that's a position many of us find ourselves in at some point in our lives where you know what you need to do, but you somehow are mm-hmm. managing your emotions and your internal state yeah. so you don't have to do it, you know, until you break completely. <laughs> Uh, but don't let it get to the point where you break completely. You know, yeah. take that responsibility and make start making those changes now. Mm-hmm. And j- just very quickly, I've been meaning to say this to you, but I was once in my history class and the professor on the first day, she gave everybody like feedback cards, just explaining, you know, what is your name? Just tell me stuff about you. And this was in a massive lecture hall and she c- compiled all of the notes together. And during the break, she read it to herself. And when we came back, she stood in front of the class and her jaw dropped. And I swear, you know, this is what she said. She said, I can't believe how many of you are nihilists. SubhanAllah. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And That's at that crazy. Moment, and the, cra- the crazy thing is at that moment, when I looked at everybody in my classroom, I was like, they all look like normal people. Yeah. Which made me realize that the person who is going through this deep crisis of meaning it's not somebody who outwardly, you know, they dress bad. They're kind of like slooped down. No, they literally look like the average person. It's just inside they're burning and they're really looking for something, you know, to fill that void. And they're, and they're starting to realize that no amount of money can fill the void in the heart. And the only thing that really can is, is that the remembrance of Allah is what really brings peace into the person's heart. Absolutely, bro. It's you know, uh, it's you know, Allah's calling us to something far greater than, than you know for our lives than we can ever, you know, imagine for ourselves. But it is gonna t- it takes effort, and you know, it's about making the sacrifices and going on that journey for yourself. Hmm. I mean, if even if you just make that intention and start doing that, you can do some great things for yourself, hmm. your life, you know, your hereafter, for the world in general. But it's 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 gonna take some courage and take some sacrifice, you know, and I mean, it's 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 the way we work as human beings, bro. Nothing good comes without sacrifice. Our lives are testament to this, you know. So you go to the gym, you know. You go, you hit the weights. You're pain, you're in pain. You're screaming sometimes. Yeah. That's sacrifice. That's pain. You're putting yourself through that because you know that the the the, the result of that is going to be health, you know, whatever the case is. And and you put you do the you put in the effort. We need to start doing the same for our spiritual lives as well. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And as Nietzsche famously said. To live is to suffer, but to survive is to find some meaning in that suffering. And one of the things that Islam teaches us is that in everything that happens, there's a hadith that everything that happens to a believer um, is good. Um, and there, so, there, so in everything that happens within our life, we understand that Allah has done it for a specific reason and that there's meaning and there's purpose to it. There's not the sort of randomness that some people like to attribute. Absolutely, bro. We need, we need to stop surviving. We need to start thriving. You know, and that's what Islam is calling yeah. you to, to thrive. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's our choice now. Are we going to answer that call and, and move in that direction or are we just going to continue to survive? You know, so that's that choice is with every single individual, every single person, every single one of us. Exactly. And I think that's an excellent point to note off is that we need to stop focusing on just surviving, getting from day to day, but really trying to thrive in every aspect of our life. So um jazakumallah khairan bro we appreciate your time um for those who haven't had the opportunity to check out brother imran's channel please go ahead and um we're looking forward to the publishing of your book inshallah inshallah hopefully a couple of months inshallah i've been saying that for a while but hopefully a couple of months inshallah. <laughs> we know how it is with authors in a couple of months <laughs> yes yeah, it's, it's just one thing or the other comes up and then you get busy but inshallah soon if anybody has any questions or any feedback, please share them in the comment section below. But thank you, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.